<clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. Um, I can see we still have participants joining us for this webinar this afternoon. So we'll um, give it one or two more minutes and then we will start um, making sure that everybody had time to join us. So welcome everyone um, to this uh, um, EAP webinar series. The title today for this session is uh, Innovative Technology for Welfare Management in Ship and Goat System. So my name is uh, Dr. Claire Morgan Davis. I'm working at uh, Scotland Royal College in Scotland. I'm a multi multidisciplinary scientist with a focus on technology and farmers uptake in extensive sheep production. Um, I'm currently leading several European EU projects on innovative technology for small ruminant, including uh, the Tech Care project, which is uh, behind me. So I'm just going to share my screen and, uh, and then introduce our speaker um, in a couple of minutes. Um, so let's see if that works. Okay. <clears throat> so hopefully you can see my screen. Yes. Yes, okay. So as we say, it's, uh, it's, we're part of the EAP uh, webinar series and today we're talking about technology for welfare management. So um, welcome, of course, on behalf of our project Take Care, as I was just um, alluding to earlier. Take Care is an EU innovative action project uh, funded by the Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program under the grant agreement uh, number 865020. Um, it's a four-year project. We started in the, the start of, of the pandemic in uh, September 2020. The project is quite a large one. We've got 19 partners um, and uh, spread into nine countries that you can see on the map. So ranging from Norway, Israel, uh, Romania, Greece, Italy, France, Spain, um, the UK and Ireland. So quite a, a big project. And we are focusing on three different types of production. We're looking at dairy sheep, dairy goats, and meat sheep, as you can see on the little symbol on the map as well, how each country is focusing on which production. Um, also wanted to say that um, the project will also be presented in a joint session at the upcoming EAP annual meeting in Lyon uh, later in the year in August 2023. So a little bit of background about the project Take Care be before we uh, go on to talk about the various um, <clears throat> presentation this afternoon. So what is Take Care for? It Take Care is, um, the full title is Integrating Innovative Technology Along the Value Chain to Improve Small Ruminant Welfare Management. So the idea is to find some precision livestock farming tool, innovative tool to help farmer and um, along the value chain to manage um, management um, welfare, sorry. So as I said, to propose innovative and cost-effective technology to improve welfare management of small ruminant and trying to adapt them all along the value chain and including some early warning system. And this afternoon we will, con uh, con we will uh, cover all of these uh, topic or at least some of them to show you some, uh, some of the uh, results we got from the project. We've got five key steps in that project. The first one is to prioritize welfare challenge and issues. And that will be um, the topic of um, some of the topic of our first talk. The second step is to identify potential innovative technology solutions that can answer these welfare issues and validate the solution found in different and uh, condition on a real farm. And that will be the topic of the second talk a little bit. Um, the fourth step is to def define appropriate business model to encourage farmer to use the tool we've identified and then, of course, communicate widely the results for everyone. So we are on, uh, on social media and we've got uh, um, also a website, so please don't hesitate if you want to hear more about the project in general to go on these, uh, on these uh, places. So a little bit more about today, really. So that was just a quick presentation of the project. So um, the first talk this afternoon will be with uh, Greta Jorgensen from Nibio in Norway, um, and with the help of our, a colleague of ours, Kathy Dwyer from SRUC. 
The topic is um, assessing priority welfare issues for sheep and goat in intensive and extensive system. So Greta uh, works as a researcher at the Norwegian Institute of Economy Research, NIBIO. She's got a PhD um, in ethology with emphasis on animal environment and animal welfare. And her favorite topics are thermoregulation, sensor technology, and animal preferences. So we will hear from Greta um, in a couple of minutes. So Greta will talk for roughly 20 minutes and then we will give probably 10 minutes for answering question and, um, and answer. After Greta, we will have Germain Tenier and Eliel Gonzalez Garcia. So Germain is a project manager at IDEL, the French Livestock Institute, working in small in new technology for small ruminant sector. Um, is an engineer in agronomy with a doctorate in management science. And so that gives him a, a dual expertise in both biotechnical science and social science. Um, and as part of the project, Germain is working on the innovative action to implement for trial and pilot farm. And uh, you will see a bit more about that. His co-presenter is uh, Dr. Eliel Gonzalez Garcia from uh, INRAE in France as well. Uh, Eliel is an animal nutritionist, but also specialist in adaptive capacity and uh, interested in developing sustainable animal production system. Um, he's currently working on precision livestock farming solutions for small ruminant, in particular the walkover weighing platform for automatic monitoring of live weight in sheep. And um, we'll hear a bit more in their presentation about that particular um, piece of technology. After that, again, the, the talk will last for probably 20 minutes and then we'll give 10 minutes for question and answer. Then we'll have a, a coffee break uh, for 10 minutes and then we'll come back and uh, there is a bit of a change of plan. It's not Ilan Alashmi who will present quantifying the value of early warning system, AI biometric ID recognition algorithm of sheep and goat, but it will be um, Alan Barshamai who is working with Ilan at uh, ARO, the Agri Agricultural Research Organization in Israel. So uh, Alan's got more than 20 years of data science expertise. He's been with ARO in the PLF lab since 2020, researching early warning system and their contribution to farm management. He's particularly interested in developing interface and algorithm for farmer decision support system in small ruminant. And uh, Alan will uh, <coughs> present us, uh, the last talk is a um, result from um, looking at uh, early warning system. And after we'll have again 10 minutes for a question for Alan. And finally, we'll wrap up. Um, if people have extra question, there will be time to just uh, ask them in that session and we should aim to finish um, in two hours time. So as we say, after each presentation, we'll have this Q&A. And to do that, you can use the question in the chat box that you should have at the bottom of your screen. And um, so that you know the webinar is going to be recorded. And uh, um, in a few days, it should be available on the EAP YouTube channel for you to look at. Um, and there is some other um, information on that EAP channel if you want to look at previous webinar and the upcoming one. So that's um, probably enough from me. And I will just um, let Greta to just um, present us the first talk. So Greta, the floor is yours. Thank you. If I can share the right one. <laughs> Looks like it. Yeah, you're fine. OK, super. Thank you. So I'm. Uh, very happy to be uh, uh, able to present this for you today. And the topic is assessing priority welfare issues for sheep and goats in intensive and extensive systems. Um, we present or we made this presentation together with uh, Inger Hansen, who is also working at Nibio in Norway, and Cathy Dwyer, who is leading this uh, work package, uh, work package two. I'll come back to that. So the aim of this work package, which uh, uh, has most to do with uh, uh, assessing uh, welfare indicators, uh, was to apply state-of-the-art animal welfare indicators to improve welfare management 
All of the participating countries are involved, uh, but the work is led by Katrin Weyer, as I said, at the Scottish Rural uh, College, SRUC. Uh, the work package has four uh, objectives and work tasks. I will here present our work with assessing uh, the welfare issues for sheep and goats. And uh, we started the work with inviting farmers and stakeholders to participate in national workshops. In some instances, separate meetings were organized for the two species, sheep and goats, separately, while the others, uh, while in other countries only sheep were discussed. These uh, national workshops gave input from a total of 257 stakeholders from nine from the nine different countries participating. And stakeholders were free to express their opinion on welfare issues and prioritization of these. These workshops were organized both as face-to-face -face meetings and as webinars as we happen to be um, in the pandemic. With the interactive tools, uh, we uh, had live voting and graphs showing what stakeholders meant. This work resulted in a list of prioritized welfare issues to be considered in the project for dairy sheep, for meat sheep, and for dairy goat farming systems. Later, these welfare issues should be matched against PLF tools that can help in early detection and treatment of problems. So here is an example of overall priorities for the two species, sheep to the left, and goals to the right. As you can see, some of the welfare issues were given the same weight in the priority ranking, meaning that the stakeholders meant that the two welfare issues were equally important. Gathering information from so many countries and climatic conditions will necessarily reflect different production systems, parasitic loads, health issues, and resource availability throughout the year. So if we just focused on the goat, one could summarize the welfare indicators into three areas, three key areas like mastitis, insufficient food and water due to agonistic behavior or illness, and indicators demonstrating the quality of the housing and environment, including bedding. Just to further illustrate the task, each of these welfare issues may be detected via a range of indicators, such as which has a range of examples. For mastitis, the sheep or goat could change their behavior in the way that the animal becomes apathic or shows early signs of not taking uh, enough food or water. Or one could observe some form of hind limb lameness. When sheep and goats are kept uh, in larger groups, like this picture shows, either outdoors or in barns, small differences in behavior and lameness may be very difficult to detect. It is vital that early signs of illness are identified and treated. And looking at this picture, can you see which sheep in such a flock is limping slightly in one of its hind legs? I can't. Here you can see examples, uh, example measures for dairy sheep divided into infield, unhandled, and handled systems, reflecting um, intensive and extensive um, production solutions. Animals may be kept in different flocks according to age and time in the production cycles as, as well. So we need uh, needed protocols for flocks that were not handled or easy to inspect up close. As you can see in this example for nutritional issues, one could detect wool biting or pulling, wool pulling in flocks that were not handled, whereas in handled individuals, one can perform uh, body condition scoring, one could detect weight change, a change in milk yield or changes in milk fat and protein content. 
So we had to come up with protocols for recording all these welfare issues. What was possible to do? What had been done before? Which protocols existed already? Had this been validated in any way? So we started the work of gathering and reviewing literature on registration forms and protocols for recording animal-based measures and indicators of animal welfare. And this should also suit uh, sheep and goat production systems. Luckily, we had Cathy Dwyer on board that, board that has worked on this topic for many years, writing and editing books and articles. We also received input from the other participating countries and researchers. And in the end, the AVIN protocols ended up being very descriptive and suitable for recording many of the welfare issues that we had identified. So if we look at dairy sheep as an example, the core welfare issues were mastitis, lameness, gastrointestinal parasites, nutritional issues, housing, environment, including bedding, diarrhea, and abortion. But several other welfare issues were also identified as somewhat important overall and were very important in some countries. So we added protocols on how to record respiratory infection, competition and aggression, water quality, heat stress, rough handling, and ectoparasites, for example. The best and only validated way, way of assessing welfare in unhandled animals are the qualitative behavior assessment, QBA. This is a holistic method of assessing animal effective states and focuses on animal emotions and their expression of these. The method is repeatable and reliable and has been shown to be useful in the assessment of, for example, parasitism, transport and pain. So here you can see an example of scoring system for bodily indicators of housing quality. These are simply scored as either present equals one or absent equals zero. Leg injuries, swollen or hairless patches, hoof overgrowth and ocular discharge could all be indicators of inappropriate housing conditions. And they are fairly easy to observe and record visually in a flock of sheep or goat. Here is another example of scoring body condition in goats as an indicator for insufficient food and water. Here the scores went from very thin, minus one, to very fat, score one, where score zero was normal body condition. In order to perform such a scoring, the animal needs to be caught, restrained, and handled. The work resulted in a thick reports with detailed descriptions of animal-based measures and their definitions for each of the production system and species. Tables involved everything from scoring of health indicators and lameness, to etograms describing behavior indicative of aggression and suboptimal housing conditions, to water quality and cleanliness of the water troughs. Um, some protocols uh, had pictures and scores as present or not. And some protocols had scores from zero to three and pictures as well to illustrate different levels in the scoring. We also acknowledge the need for gathering data on resources and management practices on the given farm, as this might vary greatly between farms and between countries. From the second national workshop, stakeholders in all participating countries helped matching suitable PLF tools with the welfare issues we had to detect. And by PLF tools, I mean precision livestock farming tools like sensors and other technologies. This graph is from the Norwegian workshop where sensors mounted on the animal were rated as the most important, following, followed by weighing systems, accelerometers and GPS collars.
Now we could begin to work together with Work Package 3 on matching the welfare issues indicators with suitable PLF solutions. This table is just to hint on the large number of digital tools and sensors available and possible to test. And Germain will give a more detailed presentation of these technologies later today. So I'll just skip right through them. But after this task of working with the welfare indicators, we could move forward with training in practical conditions. So we went ahead and uh, uh, did pilot studies in selected focus farms where we tested different PLF tools and sensors and gathered vital information on how to compare information from the sensors with the information we gathered using the animal-based measures and our protocols. In a way, one could say that we needed to validate the findings of the sensors with reality. What temperature is fever, for instance? What somatic cell count is mastitis and what is not? Could the technology detect animals in need of extra attention before the human? Would we need to develop software to warn the farmer on individuals performing differently than the rest and so on? And we are currently working on making the protocols available on the project website for all to use. We are working together with Work Package 3 and 5, running the pilot projects and welfare assessments, and we are doing analysis on the data coming in from the pilot farms. Next, we will develop protocols and perform pilot tests for welfare assessment also in transport. We are collaborating with the other work packages on feedback and testing of the protocols um, and preparing for the large scale trials that will happen later. And just as a nice example, the biological information and welfare assessment data is aimed to be used for modeling welfare scenarios, for example, and future app development. So to summarize the work with welfare assessment indicators, we have aimed to perform individual animal assessment, not an overall welfare assessment of the flock. We have identified a core set of animal-based measures focused on top three prioritized welfare issues for each country, per species, and per production system. We have also recommended additional indicators of measurements that give more overall welfare information. And these are optional, but if measured, they should be done in a standardized way. The majority of these protocols and indicators have been validated already in literature, except the ones that didn't exist. So to end this, we are very grateful for our project collaboration and our funding, and thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Greta. Very, very interesting. and. The nice comprehensive presentation of the work's been done in the, in that particular work package on the, on the priority welfare issues for sheep and goats um so we've got yeah. we've got time now for questions so uh, greta if you want to stop sharing your screen i think you're still sharing yeah something. if i'm able to get <laughs> into this <laughs> clicking desperately um, around there but okay. in the i think mm -hmm. you can just click stop Sorry. sharing yeah that's it um so I can see we've got a lot of participants. So now is your time. If you've got any question for Greta, please don't hesitate to type them in the in the chat, and then Greta can just answer them. Um, so we'll uh, hopefully uh, talk as spark some interesting questions from from us from from the audience. So at the moment I don't see anything, but. Um, I've got one question for you, Greta. Anyway, so um, so you presented the kind of a uh, of welfare assessment and uh, and the way to do it. Can you tell us a little bit um, what the feedback was from some of the partner when they try to to do the welfare assessment on the pilot farm? Is it did they find it easy to do or? Or did they have any issues and did that help you to refine a little bit some of the questions? 
Yeah, um, that's always a work in pro progress. And uh, looking at the original uh, protocols from the AVIN, they could be uh, much more elaborate than the ones we chose because we wanted them to be um, as easy as possible, like present or not present. Uh, while if you use a larger scale like zero, one, two, three, four, you will have, um, uh, it will be better to, to say, okay, it's present, but it's not very, uh, very much so, uh, or, or it's not present at all. So uh, our aim to, to make it as easy as possible and to reduce the scale <laughs> from like four to, to one or, or two, um, uh, it could be problematic as well. Uh, it's not always best to have um, uh, the, the smaller version of, of the scales. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was a, a main um, impact. But still, it, it, we need to, have to train the observers as well. Uh, and then it's maybe easier to train when, when the, the scales are smaller. Yeah, just to adapt to uh, the condition. Now we've got a few questions coming up. So the first one is uh, a question about where the system on the welfare assessment. So I, I suppose here it's referring to the production system, that first question. Yeah. Um, so Greta, if you want to answer that. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, they ask about, well, we, we made protocols on meat sheep production systems, on uh, on dairy sheep production and dairy goats, only dairy goats, not meat goats. And we also um, uh, had indicators for uh, extensive farming systems where animals were not as easily uh, caught and handled um, and intensive or more intensive systems where the animals were handled. Okay, thanks. And we've got a second one. So somebody from uh, uh, Latin America, from according to the question, and they say uh, on the subject of rough handling, which is apparently a big problem there, uh, what strategy and mechanism would help to improve? Uh, actually, in, in some way, more mechanized uh, um, handling could, could help, like weighing. We have seen this in Norway, at least. If you have more automatic, automated weighing systems where you can lead the animals one and one into the weight instead of catching each animal and, you know, with hands on pushing it into the weight, it will be less rough handling and, and less injuries to the, to the animal in that way. So actually, um, well, better systems, systems all around gates and that the animals being used to both being handled and or to to be used to being weighed systematically and, and often helps a lot. Okay. Um, then the uh, another question from uh, um, Lina Ulm saying um, if she understands correctly, there is not yet anything available for farmer to use on farm as a result of this work. It's still under development, so. I think we can yeah, well, answer well, that. The AVIN indicate, well, the AVIN uh, welfare indicators are out there and free to use for all. Uh, and here in Norway, we have several of these uh, welfare programs uh, driven by other stakeholders like the slaughters or uh, others coming into the farms and evaluating uh, animal welfare systematically. Um, so there are a lot of protocols available and our protocols will soon be available on the website. We are working on it and it's, it's not far away. <laughs> Indeed, so, and people will be able to, to download both the explanation and the scoring system with photos as well to, to show. Um, so another question from, I think the same person was asking that first question <laughs> is uh, how big is the influence of the intensity of the holding system on the welfare assessment? So I suppose here it's, um, to know if it's extensive or intensive. I think you've kind of summary reply to that one, but do you want to elaborate a little bit, Greta? Yeah, well, it's difficult to say actually, and we don't have like concrete answers on, uh, on that uh, just now. But of course, if you are aiming at handling the animals, they will be much more scarce, scared if they're not used to handling. 
So if you uh, have an extensive system where animals almost haven't seen uh, people before and, and you need to handle them a lot, it will be um, difficult for them. Uh, so uh, uh, the more use, the more they are used to the system that they are supposed to uh, to live under, the, the better. Thanks. And I think that the next question is a bit um, along the same ideas. Did we use the same protocol for extensive, so assessment from a distance, and more intensive system? No. So we developed different uh, options or, or different indicators for, well, for the same, well, for issues, but uh, of course they, they need to be different when you don't, when you can't handle the animal. So I think that the one from extensive were more based on looking at the animal at a distance, maybe yeah. with binoculars. <laughs> yeah, maybe even so. And here, actually, the, the PLF systems or tools and sensors will be a big help in the future. Indeed. So another question from Jan Ledu. Um, for the various tools, have we developed tolerance for the parameter out with the farmer? So. Would, would the farmer be warned if he has a problem with an individual sheep? So how can we work on that? Yeah, that's our aim. Uh, one of the aims actually, uh, and we need to to establish, like I said, what is fever and what is not fever. <laughs> Where are the, the boundaries here? And when should the tool, uh, why an app on the mobile phone maybe, uh, warn the farmer that this animal uh, is not performing as, it normally would do or as the other ones are doing just to to get an get an early warning system so it's a working prog pro progress <laughs> and i suppose what we're trying to do if i if i may add a little bit greta is trying to find the define what a normal behavior is and then anything that is different from normal is when we would get um an early warning system or, or something is not quite right. But defining that normality is not always easy. Nope. <laughs> um, and then we've got one last question. Um, did we use this tool on other dairy animals, uh, specifically non-conventional animals such as camels and buffalo? No. I don't know if I... <laughs> no, this system uh, or this project has uh, focused on on sheep and goats but it will be very interesting <laughs> to see if the protocols and if the ideas could be extended to other species as well and did some of the because we use some of the welfare protocol to help you develop that one as you were saying did you remember if any of these other protocol add um, information for non-conventional animal i don't know if a win i think a win was only looking at Sheep yeah. Mm. Maybe there, are, a... there are systems and protocols developed for organic uh, farming systems uh, as well, but it shouldn't be too different, actually. It's a more a question about uh, intensive or extensive systems and productions. So maybe uh, ideas for a, a next project. Yeah. <laughs> um, I think that's all the, the question I could see. So um, thank you very much to you, Greta, and, and for answering all the questions. Um, if you've got any more questions for Greta while we're having the other talks, just don't hesitate to uh, to write them in the chat. And I'm sure, Greta, you can see the chat as I can. So uh, probably answer them um, if necessary. Or we'll come back to some of them at the end of the session in case there is still some pressing uh, pressing issues. So thank you very much, Greta. I think it was really, really interesting and, and nice to, to see the audience uh, asking so many questions. So um, we're just moving now. We've, we've still on time, in fact, a little bit early. So after Greta, now we've got Germain Tignier and Eliel Gonzalez-Garcia, and it's going to be a, a double act, so uh, swapping between speaker. And uh, Germain are going um, and Eliel are going to pick up from what Greta was talking about, uh, the PLF tool. So um, how to monitor welfare issues in uh, on sheep and goat farm with innovative technologies. So same principle as earlier, um, 
Germain and Eliel will uh, present for roughly 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Uh, you've got time, we're a bit ahead of time. And then after we can uh, answer the question that you can write in the chat. You can write them during the talk as well. You don't have to wait until the end of the talk if something pressing comes up and uh, we'll see them as they appear and then we'll, uh, we'll just gather them. So I'll stop here and uh, Germain, I'll let you share your screen and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Claire. Um, so, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy uh, to present with my colleague Eliel uh, part of the collective work we've done uh, in the Tech Care Group. And today we will uh, focus on how we can monitor uh, welfare issues on sheep and goats uh, farms with innovative technologies. So to start this presentation, uh, here is a little uh, reminder of methods in, within the Tecker group. Greta presented the work carried out uh, in the first and second years of the project, which consisted in uh, prioritizing welfare issues and developing methods to assess them. And now, uh, to answer this question, how we can monitor them, we've uh, been looking for different technologies on the market or technologies under development as a prototypes to be able to measure these indicators directly or indirectly on the animals or uh, on their environments. So we, we have identified several, several technologies, tools. Some of them are available on the market and some of them are still prototypes, uh, which, which uh, some of our partners are testing in the, in the projects. And the idea now is to test them on the farms. So, Today, we would like to show you some of the collective work. First, we will present a short reminder on the welfare issues studied in the, in, by the pilots and the experimental farms in the project. Secondly, we will uh, present with Eliel the tools categories we've done and how they can contribute to the welfare uh, issue uh, studies. And finally, we will illustrate the work with three examples of technology tested in our pilot farms uh, in the project. So as uh, Greta presented, um, more or less 10 welfare issues, principal welfare issues was, has been identified in the project and they are currently uh, being studied by the partners. You can see uh, in the slide, all the logos of the partners who are working on it. And from this big panorama, we are Actually, uh, four main welfare indicators has been selected uh, to focus on within the trials. So the first one is the behavior changes, the weight loss and the change in the body state, milk yield and quality, and then the env environmental conditions uh, indoors and also outdoors. Then from this work, different sensors, technology has been classified and my colleague Eliel will explain it to you. Yes, uh, thank you, German. Hello, everyone. So just to uh, organize uh, the work in, in the scope of the project, we have been uh, classifying the families of uh, technologies and tools that uh, contribute to the precision light of farming objective in five uh, for our families. The first one is uh, all sensors and, and tools that uh, can be grouped in the identification, location, proximity, and activity uh, finalities. The second family is around life weight, which is an important uh, and conventional parameter, which is very linked to the welfare uh, status of the animal. Third family is around water. So water consumption is uh, an important resource, uh, very linked to the uh, biological functions of the animal. Uh, irrespective of the physiological stage and the uh, productive purpose. The fourth family is more uh, concentrated in the daily animals, so milk yield and quality, how uh, variations in these two parameters of quantity and quality of the milk as a, an essential final product for the animals can be affected uh, in a spectrum of conditions and affecting also the welfare of uh, the individual, but also of the flock. And finally, uh, a set of uh, um, 
a technologies that is more linked to uh, the control of the environmental conditions in Doha, but also Doha. Yeah, thank you. So if we see uh, details around the first uh, family, around identification, location, proximity, and activity uh, uh, tools, there is a first subgroup that is more linked to the indiv individual identification. And this is essential because this it is difficult to imagine precision electro farming wherever the system without individual identification. So we have a, a large uh, set of uh, radio frequency identification available in the market uh, in lo with low frequency, but also with uh, ultra high frequency, more recent uh, technology that we are evaluating in the scope of the care. A second subgroup of this family is more linked to uh, the possibility to measure location and proximity parameters uh, in between groups, but also at the flock level. So we have a set of uh, uh, trademarks, but also technologies around Bluetooth, low energy, GPS, uh, GNSS, uh, but also WISP and LoRa connections, which contribute to increase the, the efficiency and efficacy of using uh, different uh, technologies. This uh, second subgroup can contribute to uh, monitor individual social behavior or the distance, for example, in grazing system between animals or between different categories, the access to resource or feed or also water uh, source, the bonds, for example, between you and lambs, just for studying, for example, have, having an, an idea of what is happening between the the newborn and the, and the mother so and finally some monitoring of uh, the use of uh, surface management in more semi-extensive and extensive system like grassland and ranchland systems and finally there is a subgroup more linked to the activity what uh, do we can monitor uh, concerning to uh, the behavior but also the tracking, the spatial and movement patterns with the help of GPS, accelerometers, virtual fans, them, thermal cameras also, but also uh, automatic feeders that can contribute to, for example, to have an idea of the monitoring of a behavior organization, social integration, body temperature, for example, in situation of heat, heat stress or hydric stress. So on, and they indirect ideas of uh, what is happening with the health of uh, individuals, for example, lameness, mastitis, or parasitism, but also contributed to uh, control, predation uh, factors, and uh, another stress source. Thank you, Irma. Uh, next one, please. And the next family is around the life weight. So we have a lot of uh, scales, static weight platforms linking to the RFID readers that uh, contribute to monitor the individual and flock life weight of monitoring uh, the flock in different situations. Uh, but also in the, in the scope of this project, we are evaluating one technology linked to the worker weight platforms, what we so-called WOW. And both uh, static, uh, but also WOW can contribute to monitor uh, individual uh, growth rate and have an idea of what is happening with the body condition of uh, our animals. Next, please. So the next family is uh, around water. As I say, th this is an important resource. So we have uh, different uh, technologies around water matters, but also water flow matters which uh, contribute to monitor water intake, the frequency of visit to water throw, the quantity that uh, any, a given animal is drinking at a given uh, moment uh, during the day, but also just to study, for example, individual parents in this uh, drinking behavior and collective motions, for example. And this is very important today in the, in the scope of the climate change situation that we are uh, suffering. And so, for example, in hot environments like in the south of Spain or, or Greece or other countries that are take part in the tech care consortium, so heat and hydric stress is a huge problem affecting animal warfare and 
these water uh, 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 tools can contribute to uh, study and monitor you know, and improve the uh, animal welfare conditions in different situations. So, and the next uh, family that we are uh, studying, different uh, tools are linked to the to the measurement of the meal yield, but also to the composition with the help of a near infrared spectro spectroscopy uh, equipment, but also with meals, so mid infrared spectroscopy. Uh, mill yield and composition can be measured and can be monitored uh, uh, with a high frequency in the farm with the help of this device, but also we can indirectly assess uh, some uh, other uh, health status, for example, just giving an idea of uh, the mastitis and the concentration, for example, of somatic cell, uh, cell uh, counts, uh, uh, figures that we can measure with uh, the the help of these tools. And finally, we have all the a large set of environmental tools for indoor, but also for outdoor conditions in different farming systems uh, conditions. Uh, indoor, we have a lot of sensors that allow us to measure the temperature and the humidity uh, percentage that we are uh, setting in some farming system indoor. So this, uh, are, this is very important for measuring the, the welfare uh, conditions in, in, in all the farming systems that, that we are dealing. We have also uh, some tools that uh, help us to uh, monitor the concentration of particles in, in the chip herd and also uh, some detector of the concentration of some gases like ammonia, methane, or CO2. These are important tools that also, uh, with the help of some thermal and, and other video surveillance cameras, can uh, give us an idea of what is happening uh, indoor and just uh, correlate it with the productive parameters. We can have a, a monitoring, a close monitor of the of the animals and the flock in general. And outdoor, we have uh, some weather stations that we are using or operate. And in general, both indoor and outdoor, we can monitor with this family some housing comfort and quality uh, parameters that is important and are closely related to the welfare conditions. Some quality and cleanliness of uh, flooring and bedding, for example, and some indication of the uh, quality of the air. And uh, linked in the outdoor uh, systems uh, with uh, climatic parameters like uh, uh, precipitation, etc. So these climatic conditions and the, uh, uh, the results that uh, the, uh, we are able to download in the weather stations, uh, linking to some management farming practice that we are applying can give us uh, an idea of uh, uh, how to make one or another decision at the even point uh, during the year, for example. Next one, please. So just one example of uh, what we are uh, doing in, in the project around, for example, combining uh, temperature and humidity sensors for, for calculating the, the um, very well-known THE, so temperature, temperature humidity index uh, in indoor conditions. We have four steps in the uh, monitoring process of animal welfare issues with, this, with the help of these environmental sensors. First one is uh, data acquisition, second is the data processing, third one is the data inter interpretation, and, and finally, the application of that interpretation. In the first step, we, we combine the information and the data that are um, permanently produced by the, the temperature sensors and the humidity sensors, just to uh, uh, I have an idea of uh, a register of these two important parameters at different points of the shed. With this information that are collected and processed, so in the cloud, but also can be computed in a given point in the farm. And so the temperature and humidity index are calculated, 
which help us to uh, conceive or to produce some early warning system, uh, taking into account some thresholds according to uh, stocking density, for example, in the farm, the year seasons, or the physiological stage, some change that we applied in the daily routine of the farming system management, but also we can combine this information with data from other uh, precision livestock farming tools, like for example, the health and respiratory rates and the rental temperature, for example. So that gives us a, a good condition for helping the farmer decision making around key and huge aspects closely linked to animal warfare, like comfort, for example, quality of indoor environment and housing conditions, and also again, the stocking density, for example, what is happening with this uh, indicator and just to apply uh, and to decide uh, different things according to what uh, uh, it is important at a given point. Next one, please. And so another example is uh, the application or the use of the work or way platform that we are evaluating our project to monitor uh, the life weight of the individual on an almost daily basis. So we know that monitoring life weight it's a conventional parameter, but it's a, an important time and labor consuming task. It's a source of, for, of stress, not just for the animal, but also for the farmer, for the operators. And also a difficult task under outdoor farming system conditions. So uh, we have been developing an automatic uh, world system for the remote life weight monitoring of uh, sheep in a range of uh, systems. And the idea is that the life weight is collected uh, when the animal uh, cross in a voluntary way, the wall platform. And this platform is uh, strategically placed in a, a mandatory path in the farm, which is combined with uh, an attraction area to stimulate the individual passage one by one. So this, uh, uh, at the left uh, side of the slide, you, you can see uh, how, um, this uh, wall platform can be uh, located in one pile, for example, in the grazing system. So you have to warrant one sense a circuit just to have a one life weight uh, a per animal at each time that uh, he go to the water throat or just to drink or to eat uh, some mineral salts, etc. So next one, please. So this uh, worker weighing platform, we have been evaluating it in a very, a very large range of uh, conditions, going from indoor, but also to outdoor, so from intensive to extensive uh, uh, indoor, but uh, also extensive uh, grazing systems in different breeds and different uh, physiological category with growing animals, but also with adult animals, different productive purpose with a uh, meat uh, sheep, but also with the dairy sheep. And we have been evaluating that also in extreme conditions. For example, there is uh, the third picture is uh, in very extreme uh, uh, winter conditions with minus uh, 15 degrees and the uh, platform continue to work. And in that way, without uh, stressing the animal, without uh, mobilizing the team, we have the possibility to monitor almost every day the body weight of animals. If you want more information about this work, you have uh, different links in the right side of the slide. Next, please. And just uh, again with uh, the next, the, the same four steps that uh, uh, are implied in this monitoring of animal welfare with uh, this uh, device, we can monitor body condition, nutrition, status, health, and behavior. Once we have the, uh, first of all, the data on individual like way, way uh, almost daily, we can process it in an automatic way with another way application that we develop in the scope of the Take Care project. And you have the link there. So this uh, web application uh, collects the database that is uh, being produced, produced by the indicator in the platform and detect outliers and clean automatically the outliers. So that gives us the uh, growth curve uh, for each individual in, in the system in a very systematic way. One we have, once we have the data 
base uh, cleaned without the layers, we are able to uh, contribute to the uh, conception of early warning systems. For uh, monitoring, for example, what is happening with the uh, life weight at the individual level and almost daily basis. In, so gains or losses uh, linked to some practice uh, conducting to the uh, undernutrition, malnutrition events. What is happening with the growth rates, average day, daily gains, for example, in lambs. What is happening with health, some lambic events and the uh, progress of behavior, for example, by studying the kinetic of BC to the related uh, uh, weather, for example, or whatever. And finally, again, we can help to the farmer decision making around some feeding and nutrition management that we, we can modify in accordance with uh, what is happening in the reality in the field. Some change, for example, to in grazing and supplementation strategies, some veterinary assistance requiring a given point. Uh, some labor planning and, for example, just to uh, planning uh, a slaughtering schedule, for example. And that's all. So, German, you can continue, please. Yeah, thank you, Eliel. So, the last example we wanted to present to you is uh, the UHF uh, technology. So, uh, compared to a low frequency uh, tag, the UHF uh, technology has several advantages. We wanted to alight. The first one is the reading range is much better than the, the low frequency. It's up uh, to six meter, uh, more or less. The reading power also uh, of the antennas is adjustable to the needs of the, of the use case. So, it's really useful for that. And then it's also possible to read several tags at the same times on the contrary uh, to the low, low frequency. So this is a, a good options to, to study many uh, use case for the, the welfare issues. So as a first example, we wanted to show you that these two pictures illustrate the UHF devices installed to reach uh, batches of animals, of moving animals leaving uh, the sheep shed or entering in, in the field. Um, two examples, one, the first one is with wooden uh, fences. The other one is uh, with uh, metal fences. Each animal uh, wears a UHF tag on the ear, and which is detected automatically per one or more than one antennas as uh, the animal is moving. So the data, is the time step and assigned to the animals using the, the tag number. Just uh, an info about the specificity with the metal fences. Uh, they accentuate the reading by the wave uh, rebound as a, a tunnel effect. So the, the reading is uh, much better this way. And it's also possible to uh, count animals during the batching. So you can follow the entry, the exit of the animals in the building or uh, uh, to the field. And it's also to possible, possible to follow the orders of the animals. That's really interesting for us in the project to see the order of the animals in the traffic and to be able to detect, for example, uh, potential uh, lameness or injuries or just to list the missing animals uh, when they came back. This is a second example of uh, UHF uh, use case with the same device installed above uh, a point of interest, we'd like to track the antennas of individuals. So we are currently studying this uh, use case uh, as a fragmentation of water trough by lambs and adults in the project. The tag, it's the same, the tag are automatically uh, read by the antenna. And our project partner, uh, PageUp, developed a platform to extract the data and then to pre-clean it so with a uh, data processing, defining uh, what is a visit period, it means that the animal enter next to the antenna and, and then uh, go uh, outside uh, of the area. And following this kind of indicators, for example, the quantity, the duration, we, are, uh, we aim to set an alert on different uh, indicators, could be the proper irritation of uh, animals the health status of the animals and potentially also uh, to detect injuries and lameness like arthritis or a decline in the fitness. 
So thanks to an early system, the farmers could, could be able to anticipate some treatments, check the availability or the quality of the waters, or even if to modify the feeding strategy. This kind of uh, technology, the UHF, it's not uh, uh, only useful uh, by itself, it's useful when you merge the data with other technology. So we also try to add uh, cameras and we have also the information from the um, water meters, automatic water meters. So as a conclusion of our presentation with Eliel, uh, I'd like to remember that the Take Care project is a project to test to adapt, but also to evaluate a wide range of technologies for small remittent uh, farming systems. So the first objective of the project is to uh, advance the state of the art for the small remnants and to demonstrate possibilities through a uh, different proof of concept. There is a um, different existing technologies families. Uh, Eliel presented five. Um, they are all used in di a diversity of situation, but they are not all well adapted to uh, the small remnant uh, situation. So there are some questions to address. And the question we uh, are focusing on is how to adapt this technology to the small remnant situation. So the groups uh, raises some essential key points to help uh, to make the right choice and to continue to improve and adapt the solutions. Uh, the first one is the TRL uh, score um, linked to the availability on the market. So, uh, if it's not, it's uh, still a prototype. It's really important for the pilot and large scale uh, farms. And we are trying to focus now on this, uh, this work in the project. Second one is the acceptability and the economic uh, affordability for the end user, the farmers, the technicians regarding the purchase, but also all the subscriptions who are uh, related to the technology very often. The third one is the, easy, uh, the ease of use and also the maintenance of the technologies. It's very important to be able to uh, keep it uh, done by the end users. The other one is the generosity and all the capacity to cover a range of different uh, conditions and situation. As you know, uh, we are very, um, different between the, the farming system in Norway, Spain, Israel, Scotland, France, etc. So it's one of the, the big conditions we are uh, trying to solve to adapt to the systems. The final one is, it is more like a question we are uh, asking us now, combining different tech and applying an early warning system, a doc, with the, the, all the data we had, according to the specificity of uh, local situation and prioritization. This could be a good uh, umbrella approach for the project to detect uh, potential health uh, issues. So we thank you very much for your attention. And um, if you want more details on the project, we are able to uh, answer some questions now and you will find other results on the, on the website and uh, the networks of the project. Thank you all of you and thanks all to the partners of the, of the project. Thank you, Germain and Eliel, a very, very comprehensive presentation. So, um, and I hope uh, the audience has found it interesting. There is a, a couple of questions already in the chat and uh, please don't hesitate to ask more after that. Going back to, I think that first question uh, is probably going back to um, some running in commercial farm and the cost, um, can we expect to have a widespread applications or do we know which technology might be preferred? I think that's a question we ask ourselves a lot. Germain, do you want to answer that one perhaps? Yes, I didn't hear the, the beginning of the question, but I think it, it's about the, the selection of technology for large scale deployment. Yeah, it's on cost yeah. or, you know. Yeah, and the cost, yeah. We know, for example, some technologies are really expensive and not very uh, um, affordable for the farmers. So we know for now those technologies are more uh, used in their research program and research uh, or um, experimental farms. But for the end user uh, as a farmer, some of them are affordable, like uh, weather station, UHF tags, uh, or all the tags of proximity and geolocalization tags. This is a, a possibility. So we are trying to 
um, make a classification about that, seeing with the result we have in the project, what kind of technology we will be uh, able to deploy. And I think very much in line with similar question, um, somebody say it's a very good tool for research in experimental farm, but what about small holders and small herds? So um, if you don't know if you want to add a, a timing more, but I think you've already answered that, Germain. So maybe but, yeah, if you have, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just to add that uh, that is a huge question and and we are aware of that and one of the objectives of the of the project is uh, first of all understand if with this technology we can monitor and improve uh, animal welfare issues and after the application in practice is uh, highly uh, constrained by the the price sometimes and unfortunately small farmers are the more affected in that direction but the, there is a very huge and pragmatic practical situation uh, question yes sorry. Uh and I, and I could add to that is the whole project of Take Care is really trying to find solutions that are affordable and low cost. So we are very much aware that sheep and goats are often small, mm. small farms. So. Mm. Um, maybe uh, Eliel, you can answer that one. Uh, someone is asking about uh, house milk sheep and goats. Uh, do we know the ideal environmental condition in which to keep them? So have we got this? Kind of benchmarking when we look at perhaps some of the yeah um, yeah if the if the question is addressed to address it to the, the THI so the temperature and humidity index for example uh, we know that uh, that can vary for from 40 to 80 in extreme conditions so it's very linked to the combination between these two important parameters in the shed uh, temperature and humidity but there is not only temperature and humidity but uh, we can expect that uh, uh, THA beyond 80 for example is uh, 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 is that start to be uh, a preoccupation for the farmer because that uh, start, uh, start to be limit for the welfare of the flock. And in the other sense, when you are between 40 and 60, for example, we see in the literature that uh, change a lot uh, and there is no problem with, uh, with this uh, threshold of THE. But again, there is not only THE in the comfort. Okay. Um, then there is a question about predators. So they were mentioned in the use of the five PLF families. And the question is, does that mean detection of predation that took place or detection of a predation that might take place in the near future? I don't know if uh, Germain or Eliel, you want to comment on that or? I or maybe I can answer. I think, <laughs> yeah. I know that uh, some of the colleagues in the project are working on uh, geolocalization of animals, not only not predators, but the animals. But as you know, that the, the predation is really, really a crisis situation for farmers and a very political subject. So this is a, a, um, a subject under uh, under studied in, uh, in the Norway. I know that uh, our colleagues in Norway are studying this, but uh, I'm not sure that it will be uh, uh, ready now for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, maybe Greta wants to come in, but I think the idea is we can see that maybe a predator is around by having a, a different movement of the animal suddenly. So it might be a predation that will take place in the very, very near future rather than something that just taken. Greta, do you want to perhaps add quickly on that one? Yeah, we have some issues on predation on, on sheep uh, in Norway, and many farmers have started using GPS collars. Uh, watching the data from the GPS colors, they can then detect if the clock is uh, running a lot. Uh, or even uh, we have um, accelerometers that could send a warning to the, uh, to the owner if the animal has been lying down for such, so and so many hours, and then you get the death warning, like the animal is not moving anymore. So the technology is there and, and the potential is there to, to work further with this. Yeah, thank you. And I'm aware we're, we're nearly running out of time. So just one, one last question. Um, with the war system, how many sheep 
can one unit deal with? And the uh, same thing for the water intake measurement. So how many animal per yeah, unit? This is still in prototype. So we are, until now, we are evaluating this uh, platform in, under experimental conditions. Until now, the, mm, we have been working with around 300, um, around 300 animals. But uh, more than the size, uh, the size of the attraction area is the, the, the limiting factor here, more than the wall, than the quantity of wall in the, in the, in the system. And the water uh, is more indoor until now, even if we have some project in linking water with the wall, for example, we're talking about the wall. But inside, for example, we have a, a, in experimental conditions also, for probably Alon can can go back, uh, but uh, it's hundreds of animals per unit, something like that. I guess. Yeah, I think, but, uh, I think I, the I, antenna I, can can cope with a uh, many different tag number. Is that correct, Germain? There is no yeah. limit. With the UHF, no limit. Yeah. The US. Okay, and uh, briefly, I think it's it's more of a comment from um, someone and um, saying uh, if we have some work or wish to work with Latin America network, um, I don't think we, we have very much in that project, but um, I think we're, we're keen to just discuss with anybody who's interested in the work we're doing. So uh, please don't hesitate to contact us. And uh, um, yeah, we, we're focused more on, on the European scene, but um, we're not close to anything else. So please. Uh, Talk to us. Um, I think that um, we, we're just uh, just on time for a, a little break. Uh, so thank you very much again for for Germain and Eliel for a, a very good presentation and a nice question. So I suggest now we've got ten minutes break and we reconvene at twenty past the hour. Um, so that gives you eight minutes, <laughs> um, and then we'll uh, we'll go on and have our last talk uh, from Alan Barshamai. So. Um, just a, a bit of a, a little break and I'll see you all in 10 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. 20 past the hour on my clock. I don't know if uh, people are back or if uh, at least Alan, if Alan is back, I can't see anyone. I'm around. <laughs> You're around, okay. Um, I think we might give it uh, one or two minutes, Alan, and then... Uh, <clears throat> And then we can just give you um, uh, someone else asking a question to Greta in the meantime. And I don't know, Greta, if you're still around or if you're back from your coffee break, question about predation and GPS collar, um, asking if there is any good project or tool that are used by a farmer. So um, I don't know, Greta, if you want to answer. Um, quickly talking or just in the chat um maybe in the chat it's easier so yeah. um because i think yeah. alan might want to start yeah. soon <laughs> yeah um so welcome everyone i hope i hope uh, um everybody's back from a little break um so We've had two nice talks um, before the coffee break, and now we're uh, reaching the last talk, um, last but not least. So, um, Alan Barshamai from uh, Israel, from the um, Aro PLF Lab, is going to, to present us uh, uh, information about how to quantify the value of early warning system, um, artificial intelligent biometric uh, identification uh, algorithm to recognize the sheep and goats. So. Um, Alan, I think you can try to share your screen and just um, um, tell us more about that presentation. So the floor is yours, I'll, uh, I'll mute myself. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. So uh, you can see my screen? Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. yeah. Funny looking animals. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. That, in you go, uh, in you go. AI generated sheep. Yes, <laughs> mid journey. They are not from Israel. <laughs> they are not from Israel, no, they are, they are from AI. <laughs> <laughs> okay, in you go, Alan. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. So, uh, I will be talking about quantifying the value of early warning system in uh, sheep, a work that we've been uh, working on in the TLF level uh, in Aro. Um, so the Precision Livestock uh, Farming Lab is a PLF research unit 
of the uh, Volcani Center, which is the uh, Agricultural Research Organization of Israel. And while uh, the uh, RO encompasses the uh, entire range of agricultural research, we at the uh, PLF Lab focus mainly on developing PLF management concepts and uh, monitoring devices and technologies, algorithms, software, hardware, things like that, uh, all around, of course, farmed animals, dairy, cows, sheep, goats, poultry, and recently uh, even insects uh, and aquaculture. Um, so uh, I'm sure some things that I, I, I will say, I saw that my colleagues already shared John Decker, which is great. I will just pick up on some things that uh, Germain and uh, Eliel said. But in regard to uh, PLF technologies in small uh, ruminants in, uh, in general, uh, we, uh, in the Tecker project, we saw that uh, uh, many PLF technologies and solutions already exist and are being used. Over 70, uh, uh, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, were recorded in, in Tecker alone as being already in use. Um, although those technologies are there, we saw and we know, and there's a lot of work and studies about the individual data per animal uh, in regards to uh, small ruminants that is very costly to, uh, to gather. The, the cost per animal uh, makes it a little bit uh, infeasible uh, financially. Um, and uh, individual data is, I'm sure you know by now, uh, of all the talks that we had today, if not from before, uh, is essential for any meaningful uh, early warning system or uh, analysis that uh, one might want to uh, uh, conduct. Um, for that, many early warning uh, uh, systems uh, have been developed uh, that you saw some of them, uh, again, that are working in France uh, and some of them are working in our lab in Israel. But we set out uh, uh, to tackle something because as there is a, a slow rate of uptake uh, by small uh, ruminant farmers, again, because of mainly uh, uh, what we see, the cost, the cost per animal and, and the animals that are relatively uh, cheaper, uh, you have to uh, uh, approach the issue uh, in a slightly different manner. Uh, one we call one sensor to monitor them all, like a take on, on Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all. Uh, by that, we try to reduce the cost per animal. And if we can have one device, one uh, sensor, collect data on 100, 150 animals at once, we will be able to uh, uh, put it into real use in, in real world, in, in commercial world. Uh, so that's what we set out to do uh, a few years back. And our, uh, what we call our precious invention, which is our weighing trough or a uh, smart trough device that we can take and, uh, and uh, put in any uh, farm, in any pen, in any trough system. It uh, encapsulates the trough. And let me highlight here, the trough will be sitting here. And by that, we're actually able to uh, collect data on each and every animal individually. The main purpose of the, the steel infrastructure is to make every visit to the trough an individual visit. Uh, and by that, all the data that uh, we are collecting while uh, an animal is drinking, we know that the weighing sensor here below will collect the weight of a specific animal that is identified by the uh, UHF antenna that is on top here, which is uh, similar to what you saw before in uh, LEL's uh, presentation. We have a, another entrance sensor to uh, uh, allow uh, the algorithm to uh, fine tune all the readings to know when the animal is standing in the uh, exact position and exact time to collect the data to make it as accurate as possible. And the entire computational and networking array that sits up here. Uh, all the information that is being collected is uh, later on analyzed, and this is not at the moment uh, happening uh, on premise, on site rather in the cloud. So the information is sent up to the cloud and all the algorithms in the server are crunching the data in the cloud. So that's why we need this computational and networking array. What you can also see here is the uh, marking array, those two spray cans that are used later on for uh, uh, the system or for the farmer 
to uh, mark specific animals for uh, specific purposes later on. Um, so that's our, uh, the, the, the basic artifact and the basic method and, and tool that we were using uh, to collect the data on which we will act later. Um, Um, as for quantifying uh, the value, uh, just to uh, make sure, uh, if I did not mention again, we were focused on meat sheep. And in order for us to quantify the value of this early warning system, first we had to obtain some uh, uh, data, the income value per kilogram per animal, when the farmer is actually uh, or getting to the point where he sells his product. Uh, at our uh, specific study that we're talking about, we, we were looking at 22 shekels per, uh, per kilogram, and also to obtain the cost of the average uh, uh, daily feed cost, which uh, stood at about five new Israeli shekels for the same uh, situation. And by that, by getting those two uh, details, we were able to calculate a daily break-even point, which is the uh, amount, the, the, the kilograms that each and every uh, uh, lamb should uh, grow every day in order to be uh, what we call efficient or uh, over the break even line. Um, once we had those details, we marked for ourselves financially significant events, which would be animals that never go to the uh, or pass the break even line, which means they are at loss every single day over and over and over, and animals that are becoming inefficient at a certain point of time. I will uh, show two examples in a minute, which means they are produced or they are growing uh, uh, nicely, but then there is a drop in the growth rate, which puts them under the break-even line, uh, uh, rendering them again uh, at a loss in terms of production. Um, so just to clarify, the inefficiency is that the daily growth is less than the daily feed cost. Uh, LAMP 608 uh, uh, that you can see in the uh, sample graph here is one that the growth rate was since day one, you see in December 7 by the graph, for some reason, sorry, Oppa. my mouse, okay, sorry, one more second, okay, sorry. You can see the break even line here, the, the, the orange line, which is at, uh, 227 grams per day, like I said, and the growth of this specific lamb was always under the same line from the day that we started uh, collecting data till the last day, uh, December 31st, this lamb was never uh, um, crossing the break-even line, rendering him a loss at any given day. Uh, lamb 396, however, you can see that from September, Till mid-November, this lamb was growing at a very nice rate. But then around November 16, 18, uh, uh, this lamb crossed the line into the non under the break-even line, which means from this moment on, the farmer is losing money uh, every day that this, uh, uh, this lamb is uh, remaining in the pan. So by actually uh, getting those uh, informations, we were able to indicate to the farmer that at a, at a certain point of time, it's of course more financially viable to uh, continue and send those lambs to the next uh, uh, stage and leave in the pen only those that are above the break-even line. Um, so this was, and again, one of the uh, results that we were able to see. Uh, another thing that uh, uh, we saw that came in very handy as a result of the, the different approach that the farmer, you can see uh, David here uh, to the right, uh, he's our, our design partner and uh, uh, farmer, sheep meat and also uh, dairy. Uh, the, the, the change of the approach completely, uh, whereby every day, uh, even before he's getting to the, to the farm uh, physically, he will sit at his computer and he will delve into the data. Uh, he gets a dashboard of all the information that he can see each and every animal. He can see group information also, and he can also dive uh, uh, even uh, deeper into the information. And by that, 
uh, start uh, uh, actually making decisions that are data driven. And in order for uh, uh, this to be even more applicable and uh, uh, efficient, we develop also a mobile uh, application that allows the farmer or any other worker while in the pen and very uh, uh, close physically to the, uh, uh, to the animals to be able to learn more about a specific animal or the group. And if uh, there is the, any specific animal that seems in need of care or there's any abnormal behavior or anything like that, the farmer or any worker is able to uh, punch in the numbers of the tags and get individual graphs and individual data on growth, weight, water consumption, and all the data of this specific lamp that helps again with uh, uh, data-driven decision-making as opposed to what they used to do just before, which is by ear, by eye, um, by hand. Uh, that's the pen. And again, like uh, I said before, once we highlight or the system highlights any uh, uh, any lamp that uh, needs specific care or we would want to uh, take a look at them because there's a drop in any kind of uh, indicator, uh, it will not be very easy to locate one uh, lamp out of 150, which you can see here in the pen. For that are the uh, uh, spray cans that I showed before. and the farmer is able to either specifically indicate the system or tell the system to uh, spray a specific tag number uh, that he wants to uh, inspect. And on the other hand, there is an algorithmic spray uh, uh, threshold that operates without any intervention, which means once the system uh, has crossed a, thre a predefined threshold, for example, all the animals that are over 70 kilograms the system will automatically paint those uh, um, lamps. Um, let me see if I can show you the little clip that we have here. And actually, we can even catch a glimpse of one of the devices that are in the yard here, left. So there are two of them in the uh, in this uh, specific pen. Um, in uh, conclusion about that, so 17% uh, of the ship nine of a group of 53 that we uh, collected data on in the last couple of months have never passed the break-even line, making them 100% a loss. We calculated that to be over 1,170 uh, new Israeli shekels that could have been saved just in terms of feed. We're not talking about other factors, of course, like labor and other costs. 43% uh, of the uh, of the ship, 23 in number, we found to have a, a significant break-even point in growth, which means like I, I showed before with uh, LAMB 396, a point uh, uh, whereby it was a good decision to make to uh, uh, stop feeding or, or, or get rid of this specific LAMB because we're just losing money from that moment on. And if we uh, uh, put together those numbers, um, we get to a, a profit that is equal to 12, profit from 12 LAMBs, uh, which is actually around 22.5% of this uh, specific group, which brings us to a, a substantial, substantial um, loss or profit, depending on how you want to look at that. Um, as for uh, further research on our uh, work in the lab, which uh, has to do with the biometric identification, uh, there is a work by uh, Almog Hickelman, you can see the uh, citation here, that have been completed successfully in the lab and we are in the works of uh, integrating it into the same device whereby uh, we are using a computer vision system with uh, uh, machine learning and uh, uh, deep learning uh, uh, networks to identify the, the ship uh, facial recognition features using uh, RCNN and I, I will not go into many technical details you can of course ask or 
contact us later to get more details, but you can also uh, go and see the, uh, this is a published uh, journal article that you can go see uh, and read. Uh, and we are hoping that in the next couple of weeks, we will be able also to integrate that into the, um, into the work, into the device, and see that it's working on the commercial file farm uh, alongside the other uh, solutions. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, that's about uh, it about the early warning system. Uh, with all the thanks used to the uh, members of our lab, everyone you see here contributed in some way or another to a very successful uh, study and work. Um, and I thank all of them and all the partners in uh, Tech Care and Smart that uh, have contributed also. Uh, and if you have any questions, of course, I'll be very glad. Thank you. Thank you, Alan. Very, very interesting talk. And um, there is a, a few questions already in the in the chat and uh, do not hesitate to carry on. So we've got roughly 10 minutes of chat. So um, first question from Fiona Kenyon, one of our colleagues. Um, <laughs> she's saying, Alan, great talk. How is the weight gain of the lamb affected by age? Do they not all dip below the break even line if you keep them long enough? That's the first part of her question. Yes, that's a very good question. And obviously uh, the answer is yes. At a certain point of time, everyone you know, goes into a, some kind of, uh, of a plateau. But uh, since we, uh, uh, we usually will not get there in, uh, in fattening uh, to, to those uh, heights of, uh, of uh, weight, I would say, uh, this is something that we did not uh, even take into consideration because we are, very, very much below the uh, size that uh, the lamb, let's say, can get into. Uh, animals can can, go, can get as big as uh, even 80 and 90 kilograms, and mostly they will be uh, marketed at 60, 65 and 70 kilograms. So this is something that we did not have to uh, look into, but the answer, of course, is yes. At a certain point of time, everything flattens. So, hmm. yeah. And, and the yeah, other part of, of uh, um, Fiona's question is, uh, have you done any work to identify what has changed with the animal when it starts to drop below the break-even line? So why, why does it stop growing? Is it a welfare problem? Is it something else? Have you looked at that? If it's okay for you, Alon, maybe I will answer it. Oh, Ilan, yes, Ilan is working with Alon. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have a person, Yossi Lapper, who, when there is alarm from the alarming system, who should go to the farm and actually to validate it, to validate the algorithm. And obviously, the previous question, age is part of the algorithm. So this is part of the process. And already it should be mentioned already before, PLF is not uh, aiming at a specific diagnostic. We know something goes wrong, and then someone on the farm, the farmer, the vet, uh, someone else, should have a look what causes the problem. We are not, uh, we are the highly, we cannot say if it is a lamb, a lamb or some disease or some stress. This is something to be seen on the farm, which we recommend that there is a warning, but we don't really say what is the problem. Okay. Thank you for that, Ilan. I think that answer um, probably Question. Alan, do you want to add anything else? Or yes, I will just add couple more. Is, yeah, I will just add one more thing to that. Uh, it is that we do compare the group, an individual to the group and the group to itself. And by that, we can know if we have an abnormal specific individual, which will indicate an individual issue or a group issue. Because if the feed, for example, is bad and everybody is suffering from the same thing, you will see a, a, a group, a, a drop, let's say weight, for example, but if only one uh, is, is sick for some reason or any other issue, you will see it as an individual uh, thing. So we do do, the algorithm do take into consideration those uh, uh, comparisons. Okay. And um, another question, which is a bit similar to that one is, how did you determine the break-even point? Oh, okay. I thought uh, I had that in the slides. The break-even point would be the cost, uh, the daily uh, uh, average cost of feed per uh, uh, animal and the cost of selling of the animal 
per kg. And by that, when we divide one by the other, we know how many kilograms, in this case, 227 grams per day are needed to, uh, each animal needs to grow per day in order to cover the feed cost of this same day. So if an animal is eating uh, at, a, at a level of uh, $2 per day, but they are growing at the level of $1 per day per income, we know that it's inefficient or it's under the break-even line. Okay. The, the ratio between the price of the meat and the cost let of me, the feed. Yes, let me go back to the... Uh, yeah, you had it on your slide, um, Alon, so I think it's fine. It is, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah, I think that will answer um, that question properly. And um, another question is, um, does the system provide any information to help identifying the causes of inefficiencies? So I think it's probably going back to what Elon was saying, but do you want to um, expand a bit on that? Um, so like Elon said, as to a specific to identify a specific cause, it does not. However, it, it, it does uh, point the finger towards a specific animal or some animals that have issues, either abnormality in water consumption or abnormality in visits or abnormality in weight change, growth, things like that, changing trends. So once the farmer gets those as alerts, we call them alerts, he is able to go and inspect the specific animal that uh, uh, demonstrated the specific abnormality. But uh, to say whether uh, uh, it's uh, this uh, type of uh, parasite or illness, this system does not do. I, I suppose it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it's the same thing like we were discussing earlier in the two talks is um, it's pointing the, uh, highlighting something is not quite right and then you can go, go and check. Exactly, and of course, like I said, even highlight physically by uh, by marking, by spraying the specific animal, so it's easier to locate within a, a group of 150, it could get difficult, so. Yeah. Okay, I think that was all All the question uh, related to your talk, Alan. Um, so uh, thank you again. I think it's very, very interesting to see um, that presentation, very interesting, and, and thanks for the nice question. So, um, I think we, we're reaching the end of the of the session. Um, there is still a couple of, of questions to do with the, the talks in general. I think some um, people were asking questions and we could not um, um, reply them in the box. So uh, some of the questions asked were, can we have, a, how do we contact us? So I think what we will do with the organizer of the EAP webinar is uh, probably put all our email collectively if uh, all the panelists agree um, so people can just uh, uh, contact us so you know who to talk to. Um, I think there was some question uh, from the lady from uh, um, South America about who to connect, who to contact for uh, networking and then Greta there were some question to you about predation so um, we've got all your question in our list and uh, by putting our email I think um, it should be fine like that. Um, another question was about the recording of the webinar. Will it be mail, made available to watch online? Yes, it will be. Uh, no problem. I think in, it will take a couple of days to, to be just processed and it will be online on the YouTube channel of the EAP and then on our uh, website, the Take Care website later on. Um, but I think if you registered, um, the organizer, the EAP colleagues uh, will just send you all that information. So. Um, unless there is any last um, pressing question in, in the in the chat, um, I just um, wanted to, to thank you all. I think we had a, a good turnout. I think at one stage I was looking where nearly 106 participants. So it's really, really nice to see. Um, and thanks for just uh, coming and, and listening to our projects and uh, some of the results we're getting. I think we had a, a nice overview of, of going from the welfare issues from the people then to the technology and then to something uh, in the case of, of the work done in Israel uh, with the Israeli partner, something that's uh, nearly there with, uh, with, all the, um, with all the early warning system uh, in place. So, so we're still working towards that. Um, I think, um, yeah, so we'll do that. And last thing to just 
tell you, after thanking you for just joining us this afternoon, uh, the next uh, EAP webinar will be on the 14th of February and probably same time. And the title is uh, Promoting Animal Health and Welfare via Pathogen Control. So if you're interested, um, not technology this time, but something else, uh, just, just go and register for that one. But um, I want to thank all the panelists again for uh, presenting us their work today. I think it was a nice discussion. Thanks for everyone who participated and, and all your questions. And uh, thanks to uh, Andrea, Federico, and, and all the other colleagues at the EAP for uh, for helping us. Andrea, I see you've just popped in. Do you want to say one last word before I... Well, since no one did it before, and but everyone thought to thank you, Claire, for sharing so nicely this uh, interesting webinar. So thank thanks you. very much, Claire, for organizing everything, because she was behind all the activities. So thanks again. <laughs>